So today's talk is called Separate, Separate Yourself from the Pack. As we all know, we live in such a noisy digital world where you're just constantly being attacked by advertising everywhere you turn and marketing. And so the question is, how do you separate yourself as a new company, as an established company from this crazy, noisy world and from your competitors? So before I get into that, I want to kind of quickly talk a little bit about myself and what I do. Um, so I'm in the business of four Ps. It actually worked out. Pizza, periods, pee, and poop. I mean, could that alliteration not have worked out better? I think it's pretty incredible. The four Ps. Just, when, I, when, I, when it all came together, I'm like, oh my God, who can I call and tell? This is crazy. Um, so quickly, pizza. I, you know, in 2005, when there was no gluten-free farm-to-table sort of food option, I started New York City's first gluten-free farm-to-table pizza concept. And people were like, no, no, no. New York City is all about Joe's Pizza. It's all about gluten. It's all about that stuff that we love. And so it was really about how do you present this new kind of product that people know and love in a new way. And we'll get into that. So I started a company called Wild. I'm opening my fourth restaurant now. Um, you know, over the last 12 years, we've really built this really great um, sort of establishment in, in New York City. Um, our last one we just opened in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, in this magical urban greenhouse. Um, the second P is periods. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen Thinks, um, which is really looking at the $15 billion feminine hygiene category that, have, that has only had three major innovations in the entire 20th century. Tampons, pads, menstrual cups were the only things in like 100 years that were developed for women. And it, they leaked and there were issues and I kept having these accidents every month and I would be like that person with a sweater on my waist running home and changing. And I was like, there's gotta be a better way. And so I spent almost four years patenting and developing a technology in women's underwear to make them leak-proof, absorbent, antimicrobial, moisture-wicking, and really just is transformational and game-changing for women. Um, but again, it's something new and different, and you have to introduce this new concept to, a new market, to, to this market. How do you do that? And how do you do it creatively, where people are just like, this is weird, period, underwear, bleed into my underwear, that sounds weird. So that's something you have to overcome. And we'll get into that in a sec. Um, and so we, uh, and then of course it's social enterprise. All my businesses are social enterprises. For every pair of underwear sold, we fund a pack of reusable menstrual pads that goes to a girl in the developing world. Right now over 100 million girls are missing a week of school and millions of those girls are dropping out of school because of something as natural as their periods. And it's a, it's a huge, huge problem for communities as a whole. And um, that's a story for another day. Um, the second, the, the third P is P which would have come in handy right now for me. Um, and uh, we're looking at the almost $7 billion urinary incontinence market where the current offerings are Depends and Poise and these horrible brands that make women feel like you know, you're wearing diapers. And men, of course, also experience light bladder leakage. One in three women experience this at some point in their lives. And you know, when you're pregnant or post-pregnant, uh, this might happen to me, and so I have a product for myself very soon, uh, two and a half months from now. Very exciting. Um, and, uh, and for every icon underwear sold, we are funding obstetric fistula operations. Right now, when you give birth, when you're taking this gigantic head and putting through a tiny little canal, um, sometimes you rip a hole in that canal, and, or, and a tear, you tear it. In the first world, you stitch it up, and you're back in business in a couple of weeks. In the developing world, you end up peeing yourself for the rest of your life. And you end up getting shunned by your families, disowned by your husbands, and put, put in these fistula camps to die. And at no fault of these women. And so we've helped now hundreds of obstetric fistula operations, and we're gonna continue to do so. And the, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and the final frontier, the butthole, um, which is the fourth poo, um, which is poop. Um, we are looking at the antiquated way we wipe ourselves. Um, just so you guys know, toilets and toilet paper was brought to America in 1890. And the, you, like, you literally, you're like, I'm on this like, wireless mic and on my, cell, my smartphone and I'm like, adjusting the temperature with, like, and the lights with my phone and yet you step into your bathroom and poof, you're back in the 1800s. It's crazy and you're literally like, 
going to the bathroom and you're taking and you're smearing poop up your butt and you're sitting on fecal matter. This is literally what people are doing all day long in America. And it's crazy. And so I was just like, this is not okay, people. And so I started a company called Tushy um, with the tagline for people who poop because, you know. Um, and it's a very simple bidet attachment that clips onto your toilet and turns any toilet into a bidet in less than 10 minutes. There's no plumbing, no electrical, it's $69. It helps save 15 million trees a year that get cut down every year to make toilet paper. You know, it, it requires 37 gallons of water to make a single roll of toilet paper. You know, the average American uses 57 sheets of toilet paper per day to like put it around your hand and you know, like that's what happens. And it's just like a very real issue for your health. 27 million combined cases of chronic urinary tract infections, hemorrhoids, yeast infections can be alleviated by simply using a bidet instead of paper. I can go on for days, people. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and of course, you know, on a social perspective, 40% of the world doesn't have proper sanitation. You know, over a billion people practice open defecation. Over a million children die under the age of five because of poor sanitation. 50% of hospital beds alone in Africa could be alleviated by simply having clean sanitation. I mean, this is one of the global killers of our world, and we're again running away from it because it's uncomfortable to talk about. That's not okay. And so we, are, we formed a partnership with Samagra, a, um, an organization in India that basically brings clean latrines to communities in India that desperately need them. Um, and by the way, do not go to tushy.com. It is a porn site. <laughs> go to hellotushy.com. You do not want that cookie following you around all day long. Trust me. People will be like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I did. Um, so how do you creatively introduce a new concept to market? Um, the first one is active listening. So when we started thinking about coming up with our first New York City public transit system campaign, we had, you know, we have a group of designers, and one of our designers is a gay man, he's a queen, and he's fabulous. And he's like, okay, tell me about this period thing. I'm like, get, tell me a gross story. And uh, one of our designers told the story of how when she was like at a party, she was sitting on a white couch, and she was eating flan cake, and she started her period, and she perioded all over the couch. And she was like, oh my God, and she took the flan cake and smashed it on top of the period, and then she like <laughs> swished it around, and then, she, and then people were like, oh no, and she was like, clean that up. And she like ran to the bathroom, like <laughs> snuck, around, snuck out. And so they were like, we were like, food. Okay, food, let's think about food. And then we start talking about the story that my designers kept r reminding me of, because it was so funny at this point, was every single month when I ovulate, I can feel my egg dropping because I'm super in tune with my body. Um, and so I would run into my creative den and I'd be like, I just felt my egg drop. And they're like, can you close the door? We're working. I'm like, okay, I just want to let you guys know. I just felt my egg drop. It's cool. And then so, and then, so every single month I would go in and I'd be like, I just felt my egg drop. And they'd be like, close the door. And, and it just became a thing that we would do. And so based on food and the story, and again, just opening up your ears and telling stories, we came up with this campaign that went viral um, internationally, egg dropping. Um, and then this was the first food campaign that we did, um, which, you know, which we'll, we'll get into. Um, and then the second thing is that we, that we talk about is the concept of, is it fridge worthy? I came up with this concept, fridge worthy, because when you walk into your home and you're like, after a long day and you hang up your coat and you put your bag down and you go into your fridge and right before you get into your fridge, you have a bunch of pictures of your family and these emblems of like things that you love and know. And so for me, the, the challenge was to my team, can you create something so artful, so creative, so personal, so interesting that it can make the small real estate on your fridge? Um, and, and this top, that, that top left, the one with the grapefruit that looks like the vagina, <laughs> um, that uh, postcard ended up on thousands and thousands and thousands of, people of people's fridges. So we knew that it worked out. Um, and then the next thing is the idea of turning lemons into lemonade. Oftentimes you run into so many roadblocks as entrepreneurs, as leaders, as founders, it's, it just it happens constantly. And the first big roadblock that we ran into was the fact that the New York City public transit system wouldn't let us use the word period on the subway. And they said that this grapefruit would be too suggestive and offensive to riders. And we were like, interesting, because the exact same grapefruit, you know, is all over New York City subways representing augmented breasts. There's this like, you know, campaign where it's like, 
small girl holding oranges with a frowny face, and then girl holding big grapefruits and a smile on her face, and it says breast augmentation, and that's all over New York City subways. And so we were like, listen, this is a very real uh, double standard here, and if you, don't let us, if you don't publish our ads as is in the New York City subways, we're going to press. And they were like, go to press. And I was like, you call my bluff. Oh, shit. And so I was like, I didn't know any press at the time. I knew two people at the time. And so I contacted, I was like, MTA scandal in New York City, you know, like some subject heading. And miraculously, Mike.com picked up the story and the story went viral internationally and actually is this thing that put us on the map as a company. We've, we've grown from zero to $50 million in two years. And, you know, this campaign was one of the first things that really led us there. Um, and then the other thing that we did was we used customers. We always asked our customers to support and you know, come up with ideas for our campaigns. So we sent an email out to our customer base and we said, can you please fill in the blanks? Thinks is blank. And we got literally like 10,000 responses in 24 hours from, our loyal, some, from a bunch of our loyal customers. Thinks is strength, freedom, and dignity for all women. Thinks is Mary Poppins in my pants. <laughs> you know, like we got such amazing things and we were able to put these all over the New York City subway stations. And then, you know, we, we had, we initially we had um, pussy grabbing proof underwear, but they didn't let us put that on. Um, and so we, they let us do patriarchy proof underwear. Um, and so these campaigns were all over, all over New York City, all over San Francisco, and they really, you know, did well. The next thing that we came, came across, again, through active listening was the idea that, you know, women aren't the only ones who have a period. And we were like, why not? And they were, because we, we didn't understand. We're like, what do you mean, women have periods? Like, and we're like, oh, no, trans men also have periods. We realized that there are 900,000 trans people in America, half of which have transitioned from woman to man, and they have periods, too. And every month they feel outed and they're really up, like frustrated, like they, they just feel like, oh my God, this is not me. Like I, and so, and right now they had to wear like multiple pairs of boxers and put stuff things in there and it was so uncomfortable for them. So we spent a year developing a boy short with the trans community in mind and we changed our tagline from for women with periods to for people with periods for that particular pair. And the trans community was so grateful and, and, and that's really, you know, we did it authentically, which leads me to choose radical authenticity. That's, and again, the word authenticity is like such a played out word, but it's so true. You can tell when someone's like, hmm, I wonder what customers want versus like, this is what feels right to me. This is, there's an injustice in the world. These trans community, these people are, are changing their bodies, taking hormones, doing everything they can to be who they are. And yet we as the society are just making them look like these shunned outcasts because of they're just trying to be who they are. Who are we to judge these people? And so for us, it's like we did it because we were truly authentic in our, in our, in our like shit. We didn't think about you. Let's think about you and do it. And this story also went viral internationally. And again, these stories, like you can't, you, you can't predict virality. You just do things that are authentic to you and then watch what happens. Um, the other thing is press. Oftentimes people are always like, how do you get so much press? You've earned so much media for free. And it's just like we spend so much money on advertising dollars and marketing dollars. How do you get so much free press? Well, the way I think about it is always participation. I go to Burning Man every year. And one of the things that, one of the core principles of Burning Man is, is radical participation, which means what you put in is what you get out. And every time, I don't want to send out a press release with just like in those like manila folder thingies that sit on the press person's desk and it sucks and nobody wants to like receive those. You have a pile of those on your desk. Nobody wants that. So what we do is, what, what, sort of what I've forced my team to do is make sure that every single thing that we do has to have something where the, the, there's an audience participation. So for example, when we were doing our first New York City fashion show, um, this past year, rather than just giving out invitations to press during the most challenging week for press, to, press has, is in, invited to a thousand things, how do you get press to come to your event when they have, there's so much competition in the world? So I was like, okay, I want us to create this thing, this invitation, and I want you to go to Home Depot and buy a bunch of cement. And I want you to come in and create this like cast thing where you're going to like basically pour cement over the invitation and, and so when you do, and we're going to hand deliver them on a silver platter. And once they get hand delivered to the PR, the, the, to the press media person, we have to tell them to smash the patriarchy in order to attend our, our event. And sorry, men, but it's not, it's just, this is just the thing. Anyway. And so 
And so, and so it was an action, and they were like, oh my God, this is so cool, like, yeah. and then they had to like clean it out and fish out the little invitation and dust it off, and all it had was just like where to go, the date, and that was it. And then literally, we had 80 pressed RSVP'd in 24 hours, and it was like the most incredible experience. Like there, there I am doing the final speech, crying. Um, and it was like the most magical experience because again, you create something that people have, a, have a, sort of a, a hand in. You know, when, we, when, we were, when I was first starting out, this is the last quick story, or we have two quick stories because the last guy was late too, so I'm just saying. Um, and so um, uh, for, when I was first starting my restaurants and I had no biz, I had no contacts, no relationship at all, I basically created this nondescript box. And again, constraints are super important. When you, we, I created this nondescript box and I had my friend's dad, who's a doctor, give me a bunch of IV bags. And I was like, give me a bunch of 50 IV bags. So I delivered IV bags. I bought a bunch of little brown boxes from like the whatever, Kinko's. And, um, and I put uh, the, the, like, the IV bag in each box. And I said, on top of it, I said, the perfect food will be arriving shortly. Until then, don't eat anything. And then on the IV bag, I had a little sticker on it. And it said, should the lack of sustenance prove to be debilitating, please insert tube into vein." And then below that was like an invitation to the grand opening of my tiny little pizza shop. And literally, New York Times, New York, Mat like every single person covered it and came to my tiny little Upper East Side, 400 square foot pizza shop to cover. Florence Fabricant from, the, from New York Times came. And it's just, again, people want to be dazzled and surprised and wowed and not just one of many. How do you, you know, and we'll get into that in qu quickly. Um, last thing, we, we had another thing where I, I, I had my team go out and, um, you know, blow a, poke a hole in the top and the bottom of an egg and whoosh, blow out all of the yolk out of the egg. And then I had them scroll in a little thing and stick it inside the egg. And so we had an event with a bunch of press and then we had them smash the egg open to re reveal each question to answer. So again, like people were just like dazzled by these things and it, it created this, people were like Instagramming it, press was in, like it's just, it creates that hype. How do you continue to do that in a creative, interesting, authentic way? Um, so we've had so much media impressions. Um, iteration is perfection, my favorite state saying. So the last thing is the three components to entering a new market successfully. Um, I thought about this a lot across all of the four Ps. Um, and, and how do you know, and there, there really is a unifying tie across all of my brands. And how do you, you know, introduce a new product, a new idea in a new market, in an old market, but in a new way? How do you break taboos? So number one is you have to have a one of one innovation. It can't be a one of many innovation, it, can't, it has to be a one of one innovation, a product that doesn't kind of work, but actually really truly works. Our underwear is foolproof, our pee proof underwear is foolproof, the bidet, game changing people, everyone here should get one, I'm just saying. Um, the second thing is considered artful design across every touch point of your brand. When I think about my, you know, our packaging, our website, our Facebook ads, when I think about our postcards, when I think about our experience, every single touch point of our brand is so design considered. We live in a designer world. People care about design. Even if you don't think they do, they do. Font matters, like every spacing matters, like things matter. So we consider it in such a deep way. And then, and also when you're talking about something that's like periods, you know, when you, when you walk into our, in our, into our subway and you see these beautiful subway campaigns, that's like this artful gallery experience, you know, we have had like bros from like, with like basswood, like Michigan hats walking by being like, yo, that's a cool ad. And they're like, oh, they're talking about periods, whoa, you know? And, and all of a sudden, people are opening themselves up because the first thing they see is an artful campaign. And then they're like, oh, I can talk about this a little bit more because I just said it was beautiful, so now I can talk about it. Right? And so it psychologically it opens you up. The third thing is the same is the same situation. Accessible, relatable language across every touch point of your brand. We don't talk about things or icon or toshi in a clinical, medical, technical, academic way. We talk about it in a way that's like you're texting your best girlfriend. You're like, oh my God, you're, the way you write is like the way I write, and the way you talk is like the way I talk, so I don't feel scared talking about period underwear that you're bleeding into, like that's kind of weird. You know, you, all of a sudden it opens you up again to having a conversation because you're talking to somebody about it in a way that you want to be talked to as well. Does that make sense? So in every bit of it, the innovation, the artfulness, and the way you talk about it, all three together like a tripod on a, you know, like those three, if they work in unison, you can change culture, you can break taboo, you can build a great business. And I think you can do that creatively. 
in that way. And, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>